regular turnout. So if it's your first time here, we're Ashon McGill. We're a student-led outreach organization based at the McGill Space Institute. Uh, we organize uh, events such as this one, public lectures, also events called Astronomy on Tap, which are short presentations uh, happening at a pub, and we have fun, we do quizzes. Um, this year we're working alongside Physics Matters, which is the physics branch of the outreach at McGill. Uh, we have a joint public lecture series. Actually, next month, um, I want to tell you this, we have Anna, uh, the Anna McPherson lecture, where we're, we will receive Donna Strickland, which is a Nobel Prize winner from last year. So you should definitely stay on the lookout for that. You should follow us on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, also, we may do fill out surveys. We have email lists. Um, so stay on the lookout for that. We'll also have a string theory lecture next month, and another cosmology lecture in December. Um, before we introduce the speaker, we have a raffle. So we have a new method before we did raffle tickets. Now we're using a Google survey, so hopefully that works better than the other method. So, uh, so we're going to use a random number generator. We know the number of people who entered the survey, which is 18. So we're raffling this beautiful MSI mug. MSI stands for Miguel Space Institute and uh, some Astro Miguel t-shirts. Okay, first number is, where is this? Okay, let's generate a new one. Eleven. Eleven. Which is? <laughs> that would be Nabiha Milly? No, yes. Now it's out of 19, so make sure you fill out the survey next time. Because as you see, these marks are very beautiful. Okay, next one. Three, number three. Lisa Kuta. Congrats. So we'll have uh, about a 45 minute uh, lecture, followed by a 10 minute question. So now I will turn it over to Raul, who will introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. My name is Raul Mossalve, and I'm with the McGill Space Institute, MSI, and as well as with the Department of Physics here. And well, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, to you Professor Jeff Peterson. He is an experimental cosmologist, and he um, well, he got his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. And these days, he's a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And well, he's been studying uh, all kinds of uh, exciting things of the, about the universe, and in particular, the early universe. Uh, among them, uh, dark energy, uh, pulsars, uh, trying to observe, sorry, Uh, as well as uh, a mysterious kind of uh, object or observations that are called fast radio bursts that people are trying to uh, to understand. Uh, a lot of people around the world are interested in, in, in this mystery, what they are, uh, their, their origin, etc. So, yeah, all kinds of exciting uh, astrophysics and cosmology. But today, uh, we'll hear his story about trying to understand uh, the early universe, uh, in particular the period between the, the echoes of the Big Bang and when the first stars, galaxies, and black holes formed. So with that, uh, I'm happy to introduce again Professor Jeff Peterson with the uh, talk uh, entitled Cosmic Dawn, the Search for the First Stars.
silly now. Uh, all right, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, search for the first stars. Uh, this is a uh, 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 scientific adventure, but it's also a physical adventure. We go to very remote sites, so some of the most uh, remote places on the planet, in order to do this work. And so I'm going to tell you about both of those things the scientific excitement and also um, the adventure of uh, traveling to these very remote sites. Okay, now let's start here. Uh, this is a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, or the ultra deep field with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, that's maybe 10 degrees wide as you see it from the audience, but the real size of this on the sky is the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. That's how big it is. And uh, almost everything you see in this picture is a galaxy. Uh, there are a few stars. The stars are marked with little uh, crosses. Uh, and that's some scattering. The starlight is very sharply uh, contained on the sky. Uh, and it scatters off the spreader for the secondary mirror. And it makes that little diffraction spike thing. And so you can count maybe three or four stars here in the image. And everything else is a galaxy, like the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, with uh, 100 billion stars in it. So this uh, spinning spiral, oh, maybe I could point with the pointer here. Oh, that works. This guy is a, a galaxy like our Milky Way, which itself has 100 billion stars in it, right? So if, if you um, look at other patches of the sky, you see a similar picture. And so uh, marching across the entire sky and adding it all up, uh, it's 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars across the, across, uh, that we can see across our sky. Now some of these uh, stars are quite close, or galaxies, excuse me, are closer than others. Uh, this one here is, uh, relatively speaking, close. And uh, the, the very dim little dots here, those are also galaxies, but so far away we're just getting a little bit of light from the core of the galaxy, and, and it looks much, much smaller on the sky because of the distance. So, uh, uh, so there's a range of distances. Some are close and some are far. Um, now, about 100 years ago, uh, we began to make measurements of the velocity of these galaxies, their motion towards us and away from us. And you do that with the, uh, by taking the spectrum of the light and looking for line features that come from atoms. Uh, and, and those are a signature, they have a pattern to them. And you can recognize that pattern, see that it's stretched out in almost every case, the light is shifted to the red side of the spectrum, red shifted, and that tells you that the galaxy is moving away from us, and it tells you how fast. You can figure out the Doppler red shift of the galaxies moving away from us. So perhaps this is all uh, old ground for most of you, but uh, uh, it was found that the nearby ones are moving away from us, but more slowly than the distant ones. The speed is proportional to distance. Okay, so we have these galaxies, and some are near and some are far, and the distant ones are moving away from us rapidly. Well, this is the signature of an explosion. If, if I have uh, one galaxy 100 megaparsecs away, and it's moving at some speed, and I figure out how much time it's been moving away from us, and I run the clock backwards, so I let it come backwards in time, running the movie backwards till it's on top of me. If I do the same for a galaxy twice as far away, moving twice as fast, I find it on top of me at the same instant. So there's a time in the past when everything is all together. And that's 14 billion years ago. We can work that out. We know that quite precisely now. 14 billion years ago, all these galaxies were on top of us and on top of each other. In other words, the universe was a very dense place 14 billion years ago and has been flying apart for all these 14 billion years since this moment of the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago. Um, uh, and a side story, uh, I was once interviewed by uh, the radio host Ira Flato. He does a, a show on 
USNPR uh, called uh, Science Friday. I don't know, anybody have, know of Ira? Flinto, yeah. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, the producer talks to you for a little while and sort of asks you the questions he's going to ask you so you're ready to answer. But then uh, at the end, they always throw in one question you haven't heard before to kind of throw you off. So uh, at the end, uh, Ira uh, asked me, um, do you think the Big Bang Theory will ever be overthrown? And uh, this really uh, knocked me for a loop because um, I, I, I gave my answer, we kind of stuttered a little bit and, and, and blurted out the answer, which is, it's not a theory, it's an observation. The Big Bang is the observation that the distant galaxies are moving fast and the nearby galaxies are moving slow. And therefore there was a time everything was on top of each other. It's not really a theory at all, it's just an observation. Well, that's better. I can see you now. And you can see me. Well. Not so good for that. We don't have too many. That's the last picture where we will have to see a lot of detail. Uh, I think it'll be fine for the rest of the slides. Okay, so we, uh, we have a universe that's undergoing a big bang, everything flying apart from everything else, and there was a time in the past when everything was all on top of each other 14 billion years ago. And also realize that as you look out to these galaxies, you're looking into the past because of the time it takes the light to travel. So if I look at a distant one, I've seen it long ago, nearby one more recently. So I have a time machine here as far as my observations go. I can look back as far as I want as long as I can see a greater distance. So we're going to look way back in the past. Uh, we're going to look back to 100 million years. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about 300,000 years before the Big Bang, after the Big Bang. Uh, almost back to that 14 billion year time, the start is far, the greatest distance we could we can see. All right. Okay. Uh, sometimes we use a picture like this. Uh, I've seen Nobel Prize winners blow up balloons on stage with quarters pasted to the balloon, and those are the galaxies moving away from each other. And I'm not going to blow up the balloon, but uh, the balloon is meant to represent, it's a two-dimensional version of our three-dimensional universe. And everybody on the balloon thinks that everyone else is moving away from them. Uh, but actually, they're all, there is no uh, preferred location on the balloon. So we're not actually at the center of the universe, uh, or maybe everybody is at the, also at the center like we are. So uh, it's kind of an illusion from our point of view, we seem to be the center. But um, ignore that, it's actually uniform throughout space, this expansion. Well, I, um, here's a little quiz. Uh, this is a firecracker that's just gone off a few milliseconds uh, before this picture. Uh, can we pick out the pieces that are going fast? Yeah, we can. We know the pieces are going fast. This one's going faster than that one. And that's why it's gotten out so far, right? So the speed proportional distance is the signature of an explosion, and there you are, right? Okay, enough about that. We now have to switch gears and talk about the temperature of the universe. So we have this expansion. The universe has been expanding for 14 billion years, and we can look back in time by looking at great distances. And the farther we look, the faster away things are moving, and the more the light is redshifted. So well, that's that part. Now, oh, oh, I forgot to say this. Um, I, I sometimes am reluctant to show this picture because this is an explosion that's happening at one place and going out, and the universe, the explosion is happening everywhere. So I like to show this picture. I think of this explosion as happening everywhere all at once. Right? Okay. All right. Uh, now, the next piece of the story is about um, the temperature of the universe and its smoothness. And this comes from the, cause, the evidence that the universe was once very smooth and very hot is provided by the cosmic background radiation. Now, uh, this was discovered by the two guys. You can barely see them in the photo on the right, uh, photo on the left, excuse me. That's Penzias and Wilson, and they did this in 1963-64, and uh, they got the Nobel Prize 10 years later for the discovery. And they were building this uh, antenna, this is called a hog horn antenna. You used to see these on microwave towers to uh, send telephone signals between towns, but we have optical fiber now, so you, we don't do that anymore. But uh, they built a big one, and they were mapping the sky with it. You don't want to put, they worked for Bell Labs in the 60s, 
And we were just putting up satellites then, and, and you don't want to put a satellite on top of a bright radio source because uh, you would, it, the noise from the radio source would interfere with the communication with the satellite. So Bell Labs needed a map of the sky, and they built this antenna, and they discovered, to their surprise, the entire sky was glowing. They were very surprised to see this. They didn't believe it at first. They built a helium-cooled cold dome to prove that it was real. <laughs> Crazy, uh, but and they did. Uh, they did just wanted to find the problem with their antenna, uh, but there was no problem with the antenna. The sky is actually glowing, and their measurement is down here at like four gigahertz. They measured four gigahertz about right here. I don't think their measurement is actually on this plot. Their error bars were pretty big, but anyway, um, this triggered uh, decades of measurement, uh, and eventually the Kobe satellite, which is uh, at the bottom there, uh, was launched about 25 years later, and measured this super tight error bar limit on the spectrum. And the curve there is a Planck black body, a perfectly thermal spectrum. And you can see beautiful, beautiful fit between the data and the theory. The universe is perfectly thermal, or very close to perfectly thermal, uh, uh, in, in terms of this glow from the sky. Now. Um, this has been measured now over quite a range of frequencies. These are decades of frequency, and the plot goes down here to 100 megahertz. And I'm going to talk today about new measurements we've made down here, of 100 megahertz and below, attempting to see a little feature in this spectrum that comes from the first stars forming. And I'm going to try to explain to you why the feature is there, and what we're looking for, and how we can detect the first stars by looking for that little dip in this spectrum. Uh, but first, a little bit more about this cosmic background radiation. It's very smooth on the sky. You measure that spectrum, measure the intensity, move to a new place, measure the spectrum again, or just the intensity at each frequency, a uh, single frequency, and you map the sky, and you get the great picture up here. Just the same everywhere, same glow everywhere. And now, if I enhance the contrast of that picture by a thousand, I begin to see a little bit of uh, structure. So there's a, a picture to the right here is a thousand contrast increase from the picture of the left. So uh, you know, take out the average and enhance what's left. And you see kind of a, a bright glow on the right and a dim glow on the left. And that is comes about, we understand this, it comes about because uh, the Milky Way galaxy and the ones surrounding it have, have been falling into the Virgo cluster of galaxies for several billion years. And we've picked up 600 kilometers per second of speed towards Virgo, and that's the direction of Virgo. And we see the cosmic background a little bit brighter because of the Doppler shift of the, of the cosmic background. We're, we're moving towards the uh, shell that's emitting this light. Right, and so that's the first thing you see, and then also you see a little bit of Milky Way glow, and that's not coffee background, that's synchrotron emission in the Milky Way. It's electrons moving in magnetic fields making radiation. And uh, that's a kind of an interference, so we wish we didn't have that, uh, but there's that glow for the Milky Way uh, that interferes slightly with that picture. Well, other than this um, Doppler shift of our motion, uh, there's nothing left of that image apart from the Milky Way until you enhance the contrast again. So you, let's subtract away the Doppler emission and then enhance what's left, another factor of 100. Now we're up to a contrast improvement of 100,000 at this point. And now you get the image on the left here and now you can see patches. Now you're actually looking out at a shell that was glowing 300,000 years after the start of the Big Bang. Uh, before that time, the universe was ionized, and at that time, it lost its ionization as it cooled, uh, and it released this glow, and we see that today coming to us for uh, most of the age, for most of this 14 billion years, um, uh, to us, and we're, and we're looking from place to place on this very, very distant shell. This is looking back in time, way back close to the start. And we're seeing uniformity here, right? No part is brighter than any other by more than about a hundred thousandth or 10 parts per million. Extremely uniform. So that tells us two things. It tells us the universe was once hot, so um, the light has been red shifted from uh, optical light all the way to millimeter wave light, 
stretched by 1,000 feet so far away. So uh, it was emitted as 3,000 Kelvin. We see it as 2.7 Kelvin. And also, the universe was very, very uniform. No place more dense than any other, by more than a part in 100,000. OK, so now we have an expanding universe, once very hot, so hot it was ionized and glowing, very uniform in the past. right? And it didn't have any stars or galaxies or clusters of galaxies in it at that time. It just had these tiny little variations from place to place. Well, then how did we get the galaxies we have today if it had none in the past? right? Well, gravity did that job. So um, if I take one of the dense regions of this map, and actually the dense regions are a little bit darker, it turns out, uh, paradoxically. Uh, but uh, the, uh, typically, a dense region is darker on this map. So I take a region that was dense, and that's now I'm looking way back in time. So I, I can't see it as it is today. I only get to see it as it was in the past. But that's a region where galaxies will have grown by now, because it was dense. And a dense region attracts more material onto it from its neighboring regions. So it steals material from surroundings by gravity. So if I'm a little denser than the region over here, then matter comes to be slowly over time. So a region that's over dense grows in its density. And a region that's under dense shrinks in its density. And the contrast in density will grow with time. And eventually, I'll get a very dense object that will make a galaxy and break up into stars. So the growth of structure by, gra by gravity turns this very smooth universe into the lumpy universe that I showed you on the first slide. OK, so now the question we are trying to answer, there are about uh, 50 people worldwide working very hard on this, is how long did it take for the first stars to form. We have this very uniform material, only 10 parts per million variation. A star is very, very dense. Uh, you know, uh, 30 orders of magnitude denser today than the surroundings, than the average surroundings. And, and how did that collapse uh, reach the point that the star turned on? How long did that take? We'd love to know that. How, how long did that take? Um, and is there a way we could look back in time and actually witness this happening, the turn on of the first stars? And we think we've come up with a way we may be able to do this, to, to witness the turn on of the first stars with evidence, not just guessing or calculating. Um, and I'm part of a, this large group of uh, experimentalists that's trying to witness this event. Uh, the, and we call this point cosmic dawn. Uh, it's not that the stars rose, but they rose out of the um, collapsing structures to light up the universe. So this is cosmic dawn, and it's believed to uh, have been about 100 million to 200, 300 million years after the Big Bang. You can try to calculate when it would happen. We don't want to calculate it, though. We want to measure it and prove when it happened. Right, that's our that's our job. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. All right, so now we have to talk a little bit about how stars form, star formation. So uh, we have these large blobs of the universe that are slightly denser than their neighbors. They're attracting more material. They get denser in spots and break up into smaller chunks. So we've got some smaller chunks like this. Now this uh, graphic is really for if you look at the time scales. Is really for star formation in the Milky Way today. We get to uh, study this in the Milky Way today, um, but uh, we want to go back to the early universe. It's a little bit different in the early universe, so. But uh, I, I found a graphic for today's star formation. So what happens is uh, these clouds begin to get very dense. First of all, the universe is initially expanding. So uh, one region is. Let me see if I can. Stop holding this and put it in my pocket or something. Let's see. Yeah, maybe that'll work. Something like that. All right. Okay. So uh, we have these regions that are flying apart from each other and expanding, but some of them are so dense they gather extra material and actually begin to contract, even though they're moving apart from each other. So uh, a dense region 
stops expanding and begins to contract eventually. It takes some time for that to happen. And then as it's contracting, it's on its way to becoming a, a galaxy that breaks up into stars, but uh, it gets stalled. So here's what happens. As it shrinks, so now it's not expanding anymore, it's shrinking by gravity. And so, uh, you know, uh, if you uh, drop a baseball towards the sun, it, it, it goes faster and faster as it gets near the sun. So this infalling material is going faster and faster as it comes in. And it starts colliding with other material and it heats up until all the atoms are moving fast. And you can get to the point that each atom is in orbit around the rest. It's moving so fast it finds itself in orbit. And then it doesn't shrink. You know, when something is moving so fast it's in orbit, it's falling, but it never gets it any closer. Like the space station, right? So the space station is flying along over the surface of the Earth, 100, uh, 200 kilometers up, 500 kilometers, and it's falling because gravity's pulling it, but it just misses the Earth because it's moving too fast. Right? And then it moves over and it finds itself still the same height above the Earth, and then it falls some more, and it still misses. Well, that happens to all the atoms in the cloud. They're all moving so fast, they can't get in any farther. You know, it becomes buoyant from its own temperature, and it can't collapse anymore. And it would just be buoyant there forever if there was no way to lose energy. So it has to lose energy to shrink, and it does it by radiating by radiation. Radiation is the way uh, that a cloud like this loses energy. And the radiation happens through atomic and molecular lines in a cloud in the Milky Way. Uh, two atoms can collide, make an excited state, of, it then decays and a photon leaves, and now you've lost some energy and the cloud can shrink a little bit. So that uh, radiation process takes millions of years to allow this cloud to shrink to star size. Eventually, you know, gravity, you can't win against gravity. Gravity always wins. It always makes things smaller, 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 denser, denser, denser. Uh, you can hold off against gravity for a while, but eventually gravity is going to win. And it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, and eventually the density at the center becomes 100 times that of water, and um, uh, the temperature goes up to 10 million Kelvin, and then you get fusion at the center, and now you have a star. And it takes millions of years. And it takes longer in the early universe than it does in the Milky Way today. Because the lines that help these clouds cool, the best ones are lines of carbon and molecular lines like carbon monoxide. And the early universe has no carbon. Carbon is made in stars. So when you want to make the first stars, you don't have any carbon. So it's very hard for it to cool. What cools these clouds, we don't have in the early universe. It takes a lot longer, instead of 10 million years, 100 million years for this first star to form. Okay. All right, good. Uh, here's a picture of a real star forming region. Uh, you saw the theorist schematic drawing in the last slide. This is what it really looks like. And uh, this is the Eagle Nebula. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous picture, of course. Yeah, one of my favorites. And it's very dark. Now see how dark this is? It's opaque. That's dust. There's dust in there and molecules, and that stuff's opaque. And so it's very hard to, there are stars forming inside that cloud right now. You can't see them though, because there's too much dust in the way. Now we can use millimeter telescopes and infrared telescopes and peer in to some degree, but it's hard to do, and it's not spherical. It's very complicated and very messy. You can see that, right? Uh, this uh, cloud, by the way, is being, there's some stars up here, and even farther away there are even more, that were born a few million years ago, and they're very hot O and B stars, and their light is blowing this whole nebula away. You can see these little streamers, see this over here, this streamer coming away. So that's a little lump that's going to get evaporated by all that light that, that might have formed a star if it had been left alone. But the stuff is just going to be blown away by all the other stars, and that's probably not going to make a star. But these regions are dense enough, they're still making stars. I think this right here is a young star near the surface, you can see right there. Yeah. We can see a few. But anyway, it's much more complicated. 
uh, than you'd imagine. And I like to show this picture just because it's so beautiful. I mean, if you're a painter and you tried to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a painting of the star-forming universe uh, or in the galaxy, your imagination would fall far short of that actual picture, right? Yeah, you, you, you know, you're, the mind is not uh, clever enough to come up with the real world. Um, okay, so now we have to, uh, so hopefully I haven't uh, confused you too much yet. <laughs> Maybe everybody is following. So we, we now get to the hard part. It won't take too long, I won't spend too much time on it, but, but this is actually the difficult bit to explain. And it's how we get the dip in the spectrum that we're looking for. And I'm gonna to try to explain it. I've never done this in a public lecture before, so um, I'm gonna give it a try, okay? So you know that hydrogen has levels, atomic levels, and transitions between these levels are when photons are absorbed or emitted, right? So this is the hydrogen uh, atom, it's got a nucleus, the proton, and uh, uh, orbiting electron, which is actually orbiting in a quantum mechanical cloud, but we show it here as like a circular orbit. Um, okay, and uh, we know that there, there are energy levels of this atom. I can extend to n equal one, the innermost state, and I can go to n equals two by exciting it with a photon and putting the electron farther out, and those are p orbitals, if you remember from chemistry. And so, um, so uh, they have a, a different shape, uh, and they're farther out, and it's higher energy, and it takes 10 EV of energy to go from uh, n equals 1 to n equals 2, and that wavelength of light is 121 nanometers. That's ultraviolet light. It's very hard UV. You get a, a, quite a suntan from that. From that. You, you, you don't go outside when there's a lot of uh, 121 nanometers uh, shining. It doesn't get to the atmosphere, so you don't have to. All right, so that's the n equals one to uh, two to one transition, uh, and uh, uh, that is caused by UV light. But now this cosmic background that I mentioned before uh, doesn't have any UV light; it has radio waves, and the radio waves interact with a, a very much lower energy level that the uh, atom has, and that comes from the alignment of the two magnets in the atom, the proton and the electron. They're both magnetic. They're spinning and they have a magnetic field. And whether they're both up or one up, one down determines an energy level. It's not a very big difference. It's not like this 10 EV of the, uh, to of the uh, transition, uh, optical transition. It's much, much lower energy. And amazingly, hydrogen gas can make, as it makes a transition between these two levels, can make a very long wavelength wave of 21 centimeters. So the wavelength of this transition is very long, 21 centimeters. Okay. Now, <laughs> okay. So in uh, the early universe, we have this hydrogen. So now we're thinking of the era before the first stars have formed. Uh, the, uh, we have uniform gas, it's beginning to condense to make stars, and we have this hydrogen gas everywhere, but it's never excited up to the n equals 2 level because there's not any UV around. The stars are going to make the UV in a minute, but they haven't made any yet. So what happens is, the only thing they have to interact with is this cosmic background glow. So they come to equilibrium, some in the higher energy level, some in the lower energy level, appropriate for the temperature of the cosmic background at that uh, time. I think come to equilibrium. Now, what happens is the first stars turn on. And once they turn on, they send ultraviolet out into the universe. And they make this transition from one to two. Uh, so I promote the electron to higher energy levels by absorbing a 121 nanometer photon. And then in 10 nanoseconds, that atom will decay back down to where it came from. And it'll emit the same photon back into space. And then that photon will hit another atom, and it will excite it, and then it decays. So if these photons are like uh, pachinko balls going, you know, back and forth between the atoms, and uh, exciting them, and then the new photons are made, and they decay. Well, what happens is, if these atoms are moving with respect to each other, there becomes a little bit of a preference for making either the higher energy level of this 21 centimeter line or the lower one. 
So all of a sudden, the temperature of the gas matters. Is it moving fast? Are the atoms moving fast? If they're moving fast, then you uh, tend to excite the higher energy level when it comes back down to the, um, to the n equals 1 state. All right. This has a name. It's called the Wothausen field effect. And it's very effective. It changes the energy levels distribution of these atoms. And it causes these atoms to absorb the cosmic background. They've been in equilibrium with the cosmic background before this, absorbing an occasional photon and emitting an occasional photon, but on average, not changing the intensity. But now, uh, when the light comes on for the first stars, they become a little bit absorbing, because the gas is actually colder than the cosmic background at that time. And they become a little bit absorbing, and they take away light from the cosmic background, and they make it dimmer. So we can get a little feature in that sloping cosmic background spectrum. So here, here's the spectrum again. Um, and down here, well, it's actually below the bottom of my plot. There's a tiny little dip in the spectrum. Uh, it's blown up here in the top, uh, top plot. So in the top plot, I've taken out the slope and I've made it level by calling it 2.7 Kelvin. And then this dip you see in the middle comes about because the first stars have turned on, and they turn on at a certain time. The time in this plot is shown as about 150 million years. And then um, at the frequency that this line, would, at 1420 megahertz is the frequency if the atoms are not moving. But remember, this material is moving away from us, and its uh, wavelengths are redshifted. So we see this not at 1420 megahertz, but it's 60 megahertz, because it's moving away so fast. And we see this dip in the spectrum. And then uh, it doesn't last forever. It doesn't last forever because once you make stars, you start heating the universe, and the gas, instead of being colder, it becomes hotter. And that happens when X-ray sources uh, turn on, and then you get this rise on the right-hand side. OK. So to say it another way, our theorist friends have predicted that the sky glow should have a little dip in it. It's 2 tenths of a Kelvin deep, and the frequency should be around 60 megahertz, or actually most of the predictions are really a bit higher, more like 100 or 120 megahertz. And that tells us when the first stars turned on. We look at this chart, and we see this dip, we look at this edge, we look up what time that was, what, what, what the universe for that redshift, and that tells us when the first stars happened. Okay, that's a lot to absorb. But that's the science. We're looking for this dip. So we have a quest. Can we measure this dip in the spectrum? Now, if the cosmic background were all that was on the sky, it'd be easy. But that's not true. We have the galaxy. And the galaxy is glowing. I showed you the stripe of the galaxy glowing in the cosmic background pictures. Well, when you go down to these very short wavelengths, or very long wavelengths, very low frequencies, that galaxy glow gets much brighter than the cosmic background. In fact, down here at 100 megahertz, it's a thousand times brighter than the glow we're looking at, than the cosmic background glow. And we're looking for a little 10% dip in that glow, and the sky is a thousand times brighter due to the Milky Way glowing. So it almost seems hopeless, really, except that. We know that this is very smooth, this glow of the Milky Way. It's spectrum. We understand its spectrum very well. It's very, it doesn't have a dip in it. We know that. So we try to subtract it out, knowing that it can't have any dip in it, and look for a dip in what's left. What's left. So we're hunting for a dip. <laughs> That's what we're doing. OK. All right, so uh, how do we do it? Well, we built some crazy little telescopes. These are the world's smallest radio telescopes. And not only are the world's smallest, they see the farthest distance. So uh, anyway, so these are some of these tiny little, they're this big. Well, I've got some, some pictures with people in them. And I've built a couple of them. And Raul has been involved in some of these projects, too. And I've uh, been to uh, Western Australia with the EDGES project. Uh, and uh, some, these are, this is a selection, and there are a few more of these. And usually it's small teams of so four or five people, 
And we go to very, very remote sites to use these instruments. Um, and I can explain that. That's easy to understand. Um, the reason for that is FM radio. I've been talking about 100 megahertz, right? That's an FM radio frequency. Well, there's, a, there's a FM radio, so if you try to do this in Montreal, you'll hear nothing but uh, country radio or whatever, but, but playing on uh, uh, CBC radio, whatever. Okay, so, um, so we go to places where you can't listen to the radio. Also, your cell phone doesn't work there. It's kind of nice. So we go to these very, very remote places, uh, and one place that uh, I've been to several times is Guadalupe, Isla Guadalupe. It's 165 miles west of Ensenada, uh, and I'll tell you a lot about Guadalupe. Uh, and uh, the spectrum you see on the right here, uh, the red curve is for the United States National Radio Quiet Zone around the Green Bank, West Virginia telescope. So there's a big telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, and several counties have had all their transmitters turned off around it, and well, uh, still you see some FM radio there. You can, there are actually six stations you can tune into and listen to, even though it's the quiet, the, the radio quiet zone of the United States. It's not really big enough and it's not really quiet enough. To do this kind of work, it's totally hopeless. And uh, we took our instrument there and we got this red curve and we said, well, that's not gonna work. <laughs> so uh, we can't look for our dip when we have that stuff blowing. But when we go to Guadalupe, we get the blue curve here, and just a couple stations, and we can cut those out of the data, uh, and then it's pretty clean. And it's because, uh, well, so I'll explain why. So, so we go to Guadalupe, but we also go other places, by the way, uh, just to uh, point out the places. Prism is on Marion Island. Marion Island is one of the most remote places on the planet. It's 2,000 kilometers south of Cape Town out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It's another 2,000 kilometers in here in Antarctica. It's halfway to Antarctica. And they send a ship once a year, and 13 people live there for the year. They change crews once a year by ship. And um, uh, you can go on the ship, and you can either stay three weeks, or you can stay a year and three weeks. <laughs> because there'll be another ship uh, coming in, if you're one of the chosen 13 to stay on the, on the island. So we, we uh, part of this project on Marion Island. Um, the one I'm going to talk about is uh, Guadalupe, Western Australia, and there's some areas in the, uh, near Kashmir in India where SARS operates. And we also use central Mexico, uh, so several, uh, several places that we've tried this. Uh, but let's talk about Guadalupe. All right, so uh, here's this island. It's very rocky, very steep on the sides. It's volcanic. And uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Guadalupe. How am I doing for time? How much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, Guadalupe. So here's our little team on Guadalupe and our antenna. Uh, we have one that's smaller than this. We have two scale copies for this particular antenna. Uh, here's Guadalupe. It's got uh, uh, a big ridge on the north end and a big ridge on the south end. It's north-south about 25 miles, about five miles wide. There's an airstrip on the sort of saddle in between. I'll show you a blow up of that. Uh, and Mexico keeps uh, some population on this island, uh, yeah, and it, you, maybe you can guess why. It's, it's oil. So this extends their zone of economic influence for 250 kilometers outside of their most distant island. So there's a trillion dollars worth of oil that's saved by owning this island, literally. And, and so they, uh, they keep a uh, little crew of Marines there, about a dozen Marines, and there's a little fishing village with 50 people. Uh, and uh, you can't go there except by permit, uh, but there's an ecology station, and we've occasionally gotten a permit. Jose Miguel has been there with me uh, several times. Okay, uh, yeah, here's the airstrip. This is the airstrip right here. Little road. This is the fishing village down here. You can just barely see uh, the uh, concrete buildings that the fishermen live in. Uh, we're forced to eat the local food but they fish for abalone and lobster, so it's not that bad. And uh, so uh, yeah, we, we usually hire one of the uh, wives of the fishermen to, uh, to give us lunch every day. Uh, yeah. uh, and we put our, our experiment up here. It's a little bit of a plateau right here. This is a, a big volcano, kind of on the slope of a volcano. That's where our experiment was. 
Uh, you get in there by airplane, twin engine airplane, though that pilot let me uh, fly it. That was kind of fun. Um, you don't want to go off the end of the runway. That's a little warning for you there. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's very tempting to overload it with too much abalone, and uh, uh, then then you end up losing the airplane. Uh, seals there, uh, quite a big population of seals. Uh, the seals are a story of ecological recovery. The seals were hunted by Russian uh, fur hunters uh, to extinction. Uh, they were declared extinct in 1933 by the president of Mexico. There were no seals left. And then a few years later, a couple seals appeared. And uh, the colony grew, and they uh, took blood samples from these seals and sequenced the DNA, and the remaining seals are the progeny of seven survivors. So they came within seven of extinction and then recovered. Uh, by the way, these scars here, uh, these are the favorite food of great white sharks. And um, that's sad for the seals, I know. But it's not so bad for the sharks, but anyway, yeah, uh, so uh, yeah. And nobody stitched that seal up in it. So, yeah, a lot of them do have those scars. Yeah, I got a number of pictures here, and here's one that shows. Here's one that shows the uh, the fur. They're, 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 they're very thick. I see why the Russians wanted to make coats out of these uh, these seals. Uh, the Russians did a couple of other nasty things. Uh, they let some cats out, let some mice out, and uh, they also uh, put coats on the island. And uh, uh, the cats are annoying, the mice are awful, and uh, the goats are now gone. But uh, when uh, modern ecologists started studying this island, there were 10,000 goats on the island, and uh, there were almost no trees left. So, um, just to show you where the trees are. Uh, so there are, are, were 3,000 trees left on this island, uh, mostly right here and right here, uh, cypress and Monterey pine. And then they did archaeology over the island. They found the island was 90% forested 200 years ago before the goats came. Goats loved to eat the seedlings and had decimated the island, almost stripped it completely bare. They barely saved any of the trees. But anyway, um, they decided the goats should not be there, and the goats were removed um, in a, a, a unhappy manner for the goats. I can tell you more about it if you want to ask. Um, anyway. Uh, they, they got rid of them, and you, you still see some goat remnants. Okay. All right. So two ecological recoveries on this island. There are now 150 uh, seedlings growing naturally. They weren't planted. They just let the seeds distribute themselves. And, the, and that's, uh, 30 years from now, this will be reforested, this island will, will be. Now, I wish they could get rid of the mice. Uh, also, there's a wonderful albatross colony on the island. The albatross come there a month to breed and then spend the rest of the... Uh, the year off in the ocean and uh, you know fly for thousands of miles. Uh, uh, this is our experiment. Didn't work very well. It's our first time out. Uh, just uh, we, we we used this mesh bag to keep our computers from sending out radio waves. Didn't work very well. We got a little bit of data. We measured this sloping spectrum. So this is this bright galaxy glow, thousands of Kelvin. We're looking for this tenth Kelvin little dip. So we're looking in here for some kind of dip feature that goes like this in the middle of that, and our dip is two-tenths of a Kelvin, and this is 5,000 Kelvin. So we could remove this to about uh, three Kelvin, but that wasn't good enough. We published our results, but we didn't have a detection of the dip, right? But in February, the EDGES team did report a possible detection of the feature we're looking for. So here's a measurement of the, the, the temperature of the sky, uh, averaged over the whole sky uh, with this dip in it. And, and each of these curves is an independent measurement of this dip, so it definitely does repeat in multiple data sets, and much more data has been added in confirming uh, that they always see the same thing. Now, you can always see the same thing and have it still be a mistake, right? That's called a systematic error. Uh, random errors are the little uh, jumping up and down from point to point. But um, if, for example, you haven't calibrated your instrument properly, and as you subtract out the galaxy, you make a little mistake, and you make the same mistake every time, then you'll see the same feature. It doesn't mean it's real, right? So, so it doesn't. It's not absolute proof the fact that it repeats, but it's a good sign. Certainly, you wouldn't trust it if it didn't repeat. 
So it passes that test. So the team found this dip, and this may be the evidence of the first stars. And if so, we do know when they formed, and that's this time right here. 180 million years. That's how long it takes to make the first stars. But uh, I, I would say it's fair to say uh, this dip has not been widely accepted. Uh, it, what it needs is confirmation from another team. That's always true in science. You don't really trust something until it's seen by more than one group. And so that's the situation we're in now. Maybe it's true. But the other reason is it doesn't really fit the expectations. So uh, here's again in red the, this dip that's been seen now uh, reduced to a thin line. And then here are the predictions of theorists of what the shape should look like. So each of these gray curves is somebody's prediction or with particular parameters of what the shape should be like. So you see they're very shallow and broad, right? And uh, they don't have the sharp sides and they're not nearly as deep. So they're seeing too much signal. Now, maybe the experimentalists are right and the theorists are all wrong. We just don't know. We don't know at this point. But uh, it's a conflict. And of course, this is wonderful in science. Now, this is the best thing you can get when you have a strange result that it repeats and you can't explain it. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very exciting time. But first, we need to confirm this. Someone else needs to make the measurement. And we're, we've improved our instrument, and we're, we're trying very hard to, uh, to check this result. Our team is. And uh, there are five or six teams around the world that are trying very hard to find out, is this correct? All right. OK, so um, stay tuned. There are many experimental group, groups trying to check this edges result. There are many theorists who are trying to gin up a way it could happen. And they have crazy, crazy ideas. Uh, uh, dark matter with a slight amount of charge. Many bright radio sources that existed in the early universe. Uh, a lot of really wild ideas. Um, none of them seem to really fit the data yet, but uh, maybe they, they will. But I have one last thing to say about it. Um, if this dip is real, if it's confirmed, maybe it's not quite that big in the next uh, uh, experiment, but suppose it's real, and this really is an effect from the first stars, and we can see it on the sky. Well, we know it would not have happened uniformly throughout space. We're looking at the average across the whole sky here, but it's got to be patchy because the first stars form in the dense, reg dense regions well, stars form in dense regions first, and later on in less dense regions. So it happens in phases. And each of those phases has a different uh, redshift to it. So if we divide this up into frequencies and divide it up on the sky, we're going to see patches. We're going to find places where stars form very early, and other places where they took more time for stars to form. And then once we have that map, we can study that with other telescopes. So this will explode into a giant field. Uh, it, it's going to be very hard to make this map because of the galaxy glowing. Uh, but it will happen. It has to happen. Because once you know the globe is there, we'll find a way. We'll find a way to do it. Uh, but it might take, uh, as it took with the coffee background, it took 25 years to start making images of it and 50 years to make the good images that I showed you from its discovery. And it may be 50 years before we map this. But human beings will do it because uh, we won't be able to resist. All right. OK, that's all I have to say. Thank you. the sky and the earth is turning. <laughs>